scripture reading today is from the letter to the Colossians. Since you've been resurrected with Christ, set your heart on what pertains to higher realms, where Christ is seated at God's right hand. Let your thoughts be on heavenly things, not on the things of the earth. After all, you died, and now your life is hidden with Christ in God. But when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, you too will be revealed with Christ in glory. So put to death everything in you that belongs to your old nature, promiscuity, impurity, guilty passion, evil desires, and especially greed, which is the same thing as idolatry. These are the sins which provoke God's wrath. Your own conduct was once like this when all these things were your very life, but now you must rid yourselves of all of them. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and abusive language. Stop lying to one another. What you have done is put aside your old self with its past deeds and put on a new life, new self, one that grows in knowledge as it is formed anew in the image of its creator. And in that image, there is no Greek or Hebrew, no Jew or Gentile, no barbarian or Scythian, no slave or citizen. There is only Christ, who is all in all. Because you are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with heartfelt compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another, forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive in the same way God has forgiven you. Above all else, put on love, which binds the rest together and makes them perfect. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. <clears throat> Welcome, Doug. St. Andrews, I haven't had a chance to say that yet. <clears throat> um, if this is your first opportunity to worship at a progressive church, you could be forgiven if, like so many people who approach progressive Christianity from the outside, uh, it just seems like we're making things up as we go. It can certainly seem like that when you've been taught the religion of the culture, uh, when you've only learned the Bible uh, in English, and you take that literally, it can seem like people who've studied the original languages uh, are the ones that are twisting uh, what is there. It can seem like we're picking and choosing as we go. And so we're having a series right now on um, the concept of Jesus and Christ, because in traditional religion, uh, traditional Christianity, that is, uh, Jesus is sort of like Clark Kent. Christ is sort of like Superman, and you just have kind of ident this identity that Jesus is the human being, Christ is the divine. And I think the symbol goes much deeper than that. Let's see if you agree with that at the end of the sermon. Um, but I think the calling is very different when we understand uh, the Bible symbolically, when we see as, as Paul does so many times, say that love summarizes everything. So that if an interpretation of scripture makes us unloving, then that means we're misunderstanding. I remember when we first started uh, standing up for people. Uh, it was very common for the church to persecute lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people. And so when we stopped doing that at St. Andrews, it was seen as getting political. It wasn't seen as political to persecute people, but it was seen uh, as political to stand up for them. And that was the same thing with women's rights or civil rights or any kind of, of um, advocacy uh, in the name of the gospel. It was seen as uh, getting political, whereas standing up for the status quo was not seen as as political and learning from other religions was seen as kind of a heretic a path as well and and that's understandable when somebody looks at the bible in english it seems to jesus seems to say i'm the way the truth the life no one comes to god through me 
And the fact that we take that poetically can seem like we're dishonoring the actual words. And I think probably the, the sorest uh, part of progressive theology uh, in terms of, of people looking on is our idea of the resurrection, where we see it as a symbol of the life process as opposed to a one-time event in history where all these bodies got up. And then when we die, if we believe in Jesus, our body will get up again. And that is so popular, even among liberal Christianity, that, that progressive Christianity seems like it's just taken off and making up things as it goes. So we're going to do a series today. We're going to look at the idea that, that Christ represents universal humanity. Next week, we're going to look at the idea that Christ represents the web of life, the tree of life. And then in two weeks, we'll look at um, where Jesus is sort of a cosmic figure. But in every case, think of like an umbrella where Jesus is the handle and Christ is a, is a theological poem. It's a sacred poem that opens us up to a larger part, not of who Jesus was alone, but who we all are. We are all universal humanity. We are all uh, the web of life. We are all the cosmos. And, and I think Jesus is trying to teach us that. Paul says some very strange things in our passage today. Uh, maybe you didn't notice this when it was being said because we get so used to Paul sounding weird that we just kind of jump over some of the thing and just assume, you know, if we go numb, the passage will be over soon. But notice how this starts off. It says, since you've been resurrected with Christ. Now, that's a very strange beginning, if you think about it. Um, if the resurrection is literal bodies getting up, then Paul would be saying, well, there are a lot of you here who died and were put in your graves and were buried and um, you've come back up again. And that's great. Um, clearly, Paul is talking about the resurrection as a symbol of something else. He also says, after all, you died and now your life is hidden with Christ in God. Um, and then he says, but then Christ, who is your life, is revealed. That seems to me that what Paul is talking about is not religion, but life itself. And it seems to me that Jesus was talking about life itself. That you didn't come here today to hear about religion. I'm assuming anyway that you're looking for something deeper. You're looking for meaning. You're looking for relatedness. Uh, what is the meaning of your life? How can you be more loving? Those things we get to through religion, but religion doesn't necessarily get us there at all. Um, I think the first thing we realize that Paul is talking about Christ, when he says Christ is your life, that there's something deeper within us that is sort of the pulse of life itself. And there are things that seem really pleasurable at the time, but they make it harder to be in touch with that life within us. So Paul is talking about putting to death those parts of our habits that keep us from feeling fully alive. That there's something uh, deeply sacred within us of which we are expressions, but which we can lose touch with if we live certain ways. So he's warning us against lying, about using people romantically, um, constantly being angry. That kind of thing makes it hard for us to feel this life within us. Uh, Richard Rohr, I used to not, uh, he's probably as close to a progressive theologian uh, to, to what I believe uh, as anyone I know, but he always seemed kind of sectarian to me, so I don't quote him a whole lot, but he has a new book out that sounds very much um, in line with what we've been saying at St. Andrews for 30 years, and that is Christ represents the universal. So it's a life within us, but it opens us up to everyone, everything. Uh, when Jesus, uh, when Paul says Christ is the all in all, what does that mean? 
when he says in Christ, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. You know, I've, I've, I've said that for so many years. They're just strange words unless what's being talked about is our universal humanity. That part of us that is not defined by race, gender, class, uh, nationality. That Christ represents the fullness not only of Jesus, but I think of us as well that we are part of a common body of humankind, not just the church. The church is the body of Christ in that we learn that there, but it's incomplete if it doesn't open up at some point where we see Christ in everyone. And I think that's what the resurrection symbol in some ways means. It's the life within us that's, you know, it's cosmic. It, it, it doesn't begin, it doesn't end. But it's also a seeing the sacred in each other. And Paul says that Jesus is the all in all. That kind of seems to conflict with the idea that Jesus saying, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to God except through me. And I think the way those two can come together is if Jesus is talking as universal love itself. That Jesus is so in love with life, with the universe, with humankind, that he's speaking for all of us, through all of us, and about all of us. So Jesus is not Clark Kent to Christ Superman. It's an umbrella that opens up, and in this case, to universal humankind, to a new type of humanity where people are not enslaved, where they're not imprisoned, where they're not impoverished. And the resurrection happens in scripture, I believe. The reason it's put in terms of mistaken identity stories of the two people on the way to Emmaus, thinking it was the gardener, is that the disciples are now seeing Christ in everyone. And that's, I think, how you know you're in Christ. Not that you're the member of a church, but you see, you see something sacred in everyone that you meet. John Dominic Crossan is another progressive theologian. And I like this statement by him. He says, why are all the major events in the life of Christ directly described in the Gospels except for his resurrection? Why does Western Christianity depict an individual resurrection, but Eastern Christianity a universal resurrection? Could it be that the West gutted the heart of Christianity's understanding of the resurrection by rejecting a once common universal iconography in favor of an individualistic vision. I mean, this is something we've been talking about for decades that I believe Paul is talking about when he talks about being in Christ, it's a deeper sense of unity, a deeper sense of a sacred connection between ourselves and other people. European Christianity wanted to get rid of that for a number of reasons. Uh, but most pain an empire if people see each other's worth. Which leads us to the, the third meaning of being in Christ for today. First is, Paul says, it's the life within you. Then he says, Christ is all in all, neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek. And then the anointing happens for you. The word Christ means to be anointed. And I think what Paul is saying is that uh, Jesus didn't just audience. Jesus came so that we would recognize the sacred within ourselves. Listen to this. He says, because you are God's chosen ones. That's a pretty strong statement. Because you are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with heartfelt compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another. Forgive whoever uh, whatever grievances you have against one another, forgive in the same way God has forgiven of all else. Put on love, which binds the rest together and makes them perfect. Have you ever noticed how that's always the punchline for Paul? He does all of these sometimes very disturbing arguments, but ultimately gets back to love is, is what we're, we're trying to, to conquer. So, the reason why there can't be a non-political Christianity is because there's no such thing as a non-political human being. We are in power systems. 
and whether we stand up for one another is very important. Jesus didn't say save individuals and send them off to heaven. He said, make it on earth as it is in heaven. That we are supposed to um, make a difference in the world. So when Paul says in Christ, there's neither male nor female, then it behooves us to stand up for women if they're being oppressed in the sexist culture. culture. It behooves us to stand up for uh, LGBTQ people if they're being oppressed um, because being in Christ means seeing their humanity, their sacred worth, and not some definition that's been put on them. And then when, when Paul lists these different countries, Scyth- Scythian and barbarian, this kind of thing, Greek, Jewish, or Hebrew, it's saying Christianity has to be beyond religion. Christian nationalism is a heresy. Christ loves all people, does not have favorite countries, um, doesn't have favorite people. And that's, that's very clear in scripture. Um, being in Christ means to be beyond class. Paul says there's neither slave nor free. So how did Christians hold slaves for centuries in this country? It's because they didn't see the sacred worth of the other. You could not love another person and enslave them. You cannot love another person and financially exploit them. The love of Christ changes the world. It has to. I mean, that's that's what it's about. And finally, and most shockingly, and the reason European Christianity didn't want to hear this about this mystical state of unity and the universal humankind is there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's not religion either that Christianity calls us beyond our sectarian religion into universal love. So Christianity can be very, very faithful to the message, but it's the message of the original language and culture. It's not, doesn't, you may not necessarily see that just looking in literal English. In some ways, we either have to take the teachings of Jesus as symbolic or the theology of Paul as symbolic. If Jesus is is speaking the truth in the Sermon on the Mount, that it's not about believing that Jesus was resurrected or born of a virgin or anything else. The test is love. So the way to put those two together is to see what Christ is saying as take that literally and then take the the symbols of, of Paul as poetry. That way the two can serve each other together. When Jesus and Christ are held together, it's also talking about you. Jesus didn't just come to talk about himself. He came to free us. to us. So one of the things that Christ stands for and being in Christ means is being in touch with that deep life within ourself. The resurrection is already happening. You don't have to wait and die and have your body get up again. There's something at work in you now that puts to death the things that rob you of life and take up even very dangerous things that that call you to your full humanity. And then second, Christ represents universality, not as Americans or women, males, uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, poor, rich, um, but as, as universal human beings, as members of one family. And then Christ represents your own calling. You're not just here to be an audience for Jesus. Jesus passed baton to you and me and said for us to take up love as our way of life, to take up our own calling, to change the world. As I mentioned, I think Richard Rohr has opened up a whole lot, it seems to me. So I want to close with a quote from him in his new book. He asks, what if Christ is a name? For the transcendent within of everything in the universe. I'll read that again. It's kind of strange wording. What if Christ is a name for the transcendent within of everything in the universe? What if Christ is a name for the immense spaciousness of all true love? What if Christ refers to an infinite horizon that pulls us both from within 
and pulls us forward too. What if Christ is another name for everything in its fullness? Well, thank you so much for listening, for being here with us today. Those are my thoughts on the passage. Uh, now we'll take a moment for you to, to come to terms with your own thinking.